Well, I've managed to goof off long enough that the glue is dried. So, yeah, take it apart, see how I did. Maybe I'll do a little touch up sanding if I need to. Huh, a little bit of glue oozed through underneath the tape, and it's got a little mirror of the wrinkle of the tape in it. Cute. This, uh, you know, came out all right. I think I'll uh, take it home for a critical review. You know how that goes. Let's see if uh, it's received or not. Little difficulty with the tape and the nails, but not much. This uh, should work out pretty well. Little uh, granddaughter's Zen garden. Great fun. Check the other one. Probably pass a piece of sandpaper across these things. Kind of wish I had a, a pin nailer rather than a brad nailer because I think I've made bigger holes than I like. I think I'm going to have to get the filler out and uh, fill these nail holes. Line up. Everything's lining up really well. A little bit of glue ooze inside, but we're not going to care about that because it's going to get filled with dirt. Very cool. All right, a little putty, then a little sanding, and it'll look like something. Great. I can't wait. shellac for that, anything that's not going to be hit with the UVs? Or do you think using um, using varnish is at least okay? I guess my concern with varnish is I don't know how long it off-gasses and I don't know how attractive it would be to bluebirds if it's, if it's stinky in there, you know? I, I, I agree. I think I, I have the same feeling about it. Uh, even a, in quotes, natural product uh, still has the, the, like the tongue oil uh, still has, I mean, it's 100% tongue oil, mm. but it still has volatiles in it. Yeah. Um, I think I'd I go shellac. You would go shellac? Because I know that there's nothing in the shellac other than the denatured alcohol, which is gone in an hour. Okay. And, and I mean, there's a reason there's a phrase, canary in a coal mine. I mean, birds are extremely sensitive to sure. things. So if a sure. bird decided to make a home inside of a varnished... Uh, you know, inside of a, a varnished birdhouse. It could, could easily die, be right? put off by it. Because yeah, I, yeah. uh, one thing I know about the tongue oil that we're using right now is mm -hmm. it smells for quite some time. Yeah. Even, uh, the truth is, even if you paste waxed the inside of it, which would be another good treatment. Okay, one coat yeah. of shellac, and, but, sand it. That's the oh, volatiles, but that's the volatiles. Too. yeah. So I'd say just, I would say just coat it with shellac. Okay. Um, if, if you, because that makes sense to, if you want to be able to clean it and blah, 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 but you really, you're right, absolutely right, you could go too far because they are sensitive little animals.
I'm excited to use that star varnish. The last time I used varnish was uh, before I had any real understanding of coatings, you know. And sure. following the instructions of the sailor that taught me, you know, it was 15 or 16 coats. It was quite a quite a process to take this stuff on my boat. Um, now that I've got a little better idea of sanding technique and, and uh, finishing technique, I'll be curious to see what that feels like for me. How are you doing on the new boat? Uh, some stuff is cut. We're, we're waiting to set up an epoxy bench. I think we're going to set that up outside in one of the, in inside of the, uh, the work tent. So, um, I have four of the eight panels cut to the sizes that I need, so I'll be able to easily trace the templates onto them. brush for applying varnish. I would. Okay. What varnish are you talking about? The spar varnish for the outside. Oh, of this. yeah. Just a chip brush you think? Is I think they'll be fine. Yeah, I mean, okay. they, 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 they lose a depressing number of bristles, but I don't think that's going to be your problem. I don't think so either. No, nope. and, uh, you know, if it comes down to us deciding to varnish the boat next year, um, then I may invest in a good brush for that. But. Problem with, with investing in brushes is you are, you're, you're committing yourself to an awful lot of cleaning. Yeah, I'm fine with that with uh, latex brushes. That being said, I left one here over the winter in a thing of water. So that was probably a $14 brush that I only used half a dozen times. So. Yeah. Yeah. Thing about varnishing brushes, yeah, is even if you do a good job cleaning the brush, mm -hmm. which I believe you're capable of, yeah, um, if a bristle of the brush mm -hmm. has a coating of varnish on it, yeah, and you don't clean it off, which you can free them all up. You can have them all operating separately, but it'll never flow the same. And the other thing is, as you work that bristle, it will eventually, that coating will crack oh, off. And it'll end up inside of the finish that you're working on? Yeah. Okay. It, it's, cleaning brushes for your varnish is really hard. Just, you know, you should know that, right? Yeah, I think I used sponge brushes. Oh yeah, um, and then the last five coats or so I applied with a with a, a rag. I think that's why an awful lot of rag finishes get put on things. A lot easier to bring yourself to throwing away a rag. Yeah. I learned from uh, down in Wickford. I think his name was John Henry. John Henry. Yeah. Sounds like a draft dodger to me. Um, oh. <laughs> I knew uh, a guy. He was, he was older than that. 
right. Um, he, uh, he was the best bright work guy down in that area. Um, wow. And, uh, don't hold back. Uh, I mean, he really was. There were a lot of a lot of uh, people. You know, there's a lot of really fancy yacht owners down there. Sure, way. but the um, best Brightwork guy in Wickford. That's uh, that's saying something. Okay. Well, I don't know if you know much about Wickford. It's uh, it's a, it can be kind of an uptight community. But yeah, he he did great work, and he would complain to me sometimes about how picky modern boat owners were, <laughs> um, and that he got his start with a mop brush. And uh, and a can of uh, of bad varnish when he used to work on the schooners um, out of out of uh, New Bedford and Fairhaven. I guess he used to work on uh, on some of the old the old schooners that were out that way. Um, and the way he described it, he was using like a mop. Basically, he said it was a brush, but it had uh, the the bristles were practically like ropes. Yes. Um, and that back then people didn't care about bright work; they just wanted to protect the wood. Right. But, Nowadays, you know, people are looking for a mirror, mirror shine on it. So. All right. Well, I think got a little carried away with the putty, and uh, it will be good that I've done that. But it means that it will be good tomorrow. <laughs> Just uh, you know, you're recording. Um. Yes. All right. Sorry about that. I mean, not really. I, I like... It's the real environment. That's sure. the thing. All right. So, we'll do it tomorrow. Definitely get it done for tomorrow. It'd be great. What kind of putty? Uh, this is a uh, Elmer's glue, uh, interior only wood putty. The reason that I'm using it more than anything else is that it's it's got almost the same yellow tone to it as powder post beetle shit. Okay. Yeah, you used that one on the bookcase that you built, right? I did. Yeah. And and it uh, I'm not saying it's great for it, but it's it's wicked similar, particularly if you use. Um, de the bleached shellac, the amber shellac doesn't soak into this the same way it soaks into the real powder post beetle poop. Okay. So, but with the the bleached shellac. So you hit that with the amber shellac first. I use only bleached on this. Oh, you. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, being careful because I because I, I I didn't want that. I wasn't that happy with that that high contrast. Um, the amber seemed to soak into the, the worm poops piece, too much, yeah. a little bit too much for me. Yep. It caused me to sand more, which then started this whole process of, of undulating surface. Mm -hmm. God, I hate, I hate having the artifacts of the tools that I'm using be part of the design of something. I, I, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I don't mind if you if I bought wood from your sawmill and it had vertical saw marks in it, I would say it was charming. Mm. <coughs> so I don't hate the artifacts of your mecha mechanization, mm -hmm. but I hate the artifacts of mine. Yeah. And the, the undulating sanding thing is, said, speaks to me like, well, this is, was oh, poorly sanded. Mm -hmm. Which is why sometimes you'll see me sand, I'll put a hard block of maple underneath my sandpaper and sand with that. <coughs> People that know how to sand will put a sponge underneath their sandpaper. But I don't like the finish you get from that because it, it's too, it responds too much to the density of the grain underneath it. Mm -hmm. Says me. I'm allowed my own version of madness. You have to find your own. Mm -hmm. That's your mission in life, right? Great. That's easy. <laughs> All right. Well, that's where we are right now. Tomorrow will be a better day. And it'll have shellac in it. How can you go wrong with that? All right, so these are sanded putties taken care of. First coat of shellac on everything is cleaned up. I think these are just going to get two coats of shellac. But the client has said that she wants little feet 
on them. So I've made some little feet. That's what these are now. These are little feet. So I'm going to put some little feet in. Uh, and the trick here is a little bit of glue. Not much. I don't want to be chasing the stuff. And I've got a little teeny, teeny, teeny bit of lip. The plywood's up just a teeny bit. And so I'm going to snug that into that little teeny bit of lip. Hopefully it'll stay there. And now I'm down. And I'm going to throw a nail in. Like that one quarter inch nail. And that'll hold it while the glue is drying. And my client will have little feet. I love that part. Because, you know, if the client's happy. Isn't this great? Little feet. So, almost done. Then some shellac. It'll be great. Now, if I were using heated hide glue from a hot pot. I could use the rub-in technique. We just literally rub that bit of, put a bit of glue on and rub it and it will stay, but I'm not. So this is what I'm doing. The nail, no one's ever going to say anything about the nails. I'm good with that. Done. Done, done, done. All right. Do a little cleanup, and then we'll be shellac time. See you in a minute. Okay, so I've got these things up on little shims, and it's time to uh, throw a coat of clear, what we used to call bleached shellac on these things and that's what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, as far as history goes, I'm not sure how this stuff is bleached. I assume that what they're doing is they're literally filtering the heavy particles of uh, the shellac shells. I really don't know. But it's a uh, some people call it blonde. We used to call it bleached. It's not amber. Now, I'm painting right out of the can, and I know I'm not supposed to. But here's the thing that I know is I don't use this as a finish. And so it really doesn't matter the quality of it. I use it as a sanding sealer. This right here would be the only thing. I will buff this after I'm done. I will buff this with steel wool and wax it. That will be my final finish on this. So my point is that I don't use this as a finish. I always, no matter what I do with it, I end up sanding the surfaces. So if it's got bits of schmutz in it from, that I've picked up and transferred, it doesn't matter to me because I'm going to sand it all anyway. In this case, I'm not going to sand it, I'm going to steel wool it. Roughly, roughly the same thing. Anyway, so we'll do that. And we'll get this coated. I'm doing the tops and the bottoms and the sides because, you know, because that's what I'm doing. I don't know why. Seems to be good practice. We were always told when we're veneering stuff or applying layers on things that you apply stuff on the backs the same way that you apply it on the front. That way, if something happens with the humidity or whatever, the piece won't distort just simply because the 
you skip the coat of finish on the other side. It's really noticeable on veneered stuff if you make a veneered cabinet door. And, you know, the humidity changes heavily. The next thing you know, the cabinet door is bowed. And it's really all your fault. Because you didn't put a piece of veneer on the back side. Now, you know, why would I spend all that money to put another coat of veneer on something? But the truth is, you could just get some really cheap veneer and put it on. And so, we, we learn over time that that's what we should do. And uh, that is now being carried over onto the, the finishes. It doesn't take much. So now it's done. No, I don't believe that climatic things are going to have that kind of effect on something the size of this, but that's just not, that's what I'm used to doing. can't stop myself from doing what I'm used to doing. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, don't do that. There we go. I think that looks great. Great. All right, do the same thing on this one.
right. Um, I think it's great. I think it's going to lay down just fine uh, and uh, should buff out with some steel wool and some wax. And they'll be uh, fun to put little piles of rocks in and uh, some gravel and get one of those little, maybe I'll have to make some little rakes so that they can rake the inside of it into patterns. You know how that goes. Anyway, that's what we're doing. Uh, that's what we did. See you tomorrow. Tomorrow, we'll get it all done tomorrow. It'll be great.